say start. That's the theme. I didn't want to do any. Why do you do them if you don't? If you're so tired. Let me cover a few little things. Um, if I would have hit on a few news things before I forget, I read a article last night where a cop committed suicide. But it was from right where I grew up in North Bergen. And he shot himself in the head, I guess, in his cop car on a street called Durham Street, which was, I lived on a street called Smith Avenue. And I believe Durham was like the next block down I used to walk to a lot. In North Bergen, it could have, they didn't say 70-something Street or 91st Street, but it is the block down from where I grew up. And it was, of course, sad. I just read an article I was going to link it to like the next teaching post, but maybe I'll put it today. <laughs> and it's a very liberal guy. He used to be a New York New York Times reporter, Chris Hedges. And this is a liberal site. I read conservative and liberal. Maybe that'll benefit people. But it was very interesting. He talked about a police state. He's very intellectual man, Chris Hedges. Okay, he's a Christian. Uh, I remember hearing him years ago, the New York Times fired him or because they said, you're too radical, to the left of the aisle. But it was interesting. I, I don't agree with everything. I was a little hesitant to put the link. But it did explain some of the things that I felt as I looked at what's going on in the country. Yesterday when I was out, of course, there's always offices in every city in the USA. And they're out. And I'm not blaming each individual officer for what we've seen. But sometimes they're victims, not only in the case of this officer that sadly committed suicide from my hometown of North Bergen, but they're victims of a system. This is part of the article. I didn't read it all. But the system is... The more upper classes have particular things, houses, jobs, and so forth, and it makes them feel safe when they have a barrier of what we refer to as civilian policing. And that civilian policing, they get those jobs like firefighters get jobs, <coughs> simply to have good careers and to do the best they can. And some of the things I've seen over the years is it's really not their individual fault in many of these cases. It's what the public and what we have grown to become that we feel safer when we have a particular job title, police officers, and if they're out, if they're out, makes the other classes feel safe. I find, and that's something, that's a dynamic I kind of saw. Now, if I were going to throw any teaching out, in the beginning of the Jeroboam, uh, the teaching of kings, and, you know, I, you can't always teach everything. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic theologian from, and I never know if these are going to be teaching posts or if they're going to just be rollouts, okay? So in the beginning, you might not see this until four days. You might see it in ten minutes. But Aquinas... Uh, was the great Catholic theologian, I have one of his books up here, of the 13th century, the 1200s. Yeah, that's it. Thomas Aquinas, pocket Aquinas. Small thing. But I remember, uh, I taught a lot on uh, the history of, I think it's scholasticism, the philosophy, different beliefs. Aquinas was famous for reintroducing, uh, let's say, Aristotelianism, if I remember it correctly. But it was a revival led up to the Renaissance of the revival of the works of Aristotle and the philosophers. So Aquinas kind of, uh, but he was a brilliant man, Catholic, uh, Dr. Angelicus, okay, he referred to the angelic doctor. 
But I remember Aquinas, he was writing a lot and teaching a lot. Of, but he said, like, at the end of his life, right before he died, he put his pen and book and blog, whatever, put it all down and said, right at the end he saw so much, meaning God revealed things to him, he began realizing everything he had taught and wrote was nothing compared to what God began showing him right before he died, the beatific vision, when we're going to be in the presence of God. And so I think in terms of our lives, uh, the one thing I was just thinking about, I could have taught it, but it would take time to write everything. But even the last chapter of Kings, there was a judgment because a prophet spoke to Jeroboam, and the prophecy, if you remember, I forget what chapter, it was 13 maybe, and he said, there's coming one, the prophet said to Jeroboam, there's coming one by the name of Josiah, <laughs> and he's going to burn the priests upon this altar. The bones of men will be burnt on this altar. And that was fulfilled some 300 years later by a king by the name of Josiah, by name. How, to, uh, how do these judgments that we see relate in any way to the gospel, to the New Testament? And, and it would be hard to explain this. Okay, these king, these priests that would be offered themselves on an altar, even though these priests were considered wicked, idolatrous priests, that's why the judgment would come. Yet at the same time, it's still a type of redemption right in the midst of judgment. Because these priests were not from the law. You see, these priests were not the legitimate priests. And the judgment for their sin would be they would be burnt or offered up on an altar, which you didn't... Judaism in God's ways, of course in the Old Testament, didn't have that. But now Jesus comes in the New Testament as a priest that's outside of the Levitical priesthood. And it says in Hebrews, we have an altar which those that serve the tabernacle, the system of the law, they don't have any right. It's talking to the cross. So Jesus will come and he will be the priest. But now he wasn't like the bad priests that were getting judged. But he became sin. If you will, he became a bad priest. He bore the sins of the world. And he, as the priest in the sacrifice in the Passover lamb, would be sacrificed on an altar, the cross. So you even see redemption in these stories of judgment. Now Paul, I'm teaching Acts, so this could be like a, 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 a middle teaching between all. And Acts, the one I just taught yesterday was uh, 24, I forget the chapter, but either way. And now Paul is saying, all that the prophet said, Paul says, I'm here standing before you, O King Agrippa, my Acts study, because all that the prophets said should come and all that my fellow Jews who are here accusing me before the court of Agrippa he said they're all waiting to come to the same hope that they are now accusing me of which I believe in the resurrection I believe in Jesus I'm preaching the gospel and it's an amazing thing as I taught that chapter yesterday it says they don't even see that the very problem they have with me, the Apostle Paul, is the hope that they're hoping to come to. So ironic. And so you find which was the hope of what? Christ, the Passover, the final sacrifice, the priest on the altar. And, and it's just interesting because it does all testify of Jesus. Now, um, if I were to talk about because if I talk news things, then it's going to go up right now. And I'm tired. I'm tired. The news things of today, whether liberal, whether conservative, 
our country. Look, I'm not a big defender of Trump. I heard the speech yesterday that Jeff Flake, a Republican who says, I'm not going to run, okay, because he's behind in the polls. Republican senators so I'm not going to run for re-election. So what does Jeff Flake do? Uh, I listened to some of the speech, and he's, it's, you know, basically saying we've got to stand up because Trump is, I don't agree with everything Trump does. But the country now, for m many months, the top news, agenda-driven news, for many months, it's the Russia thing, Trump and the Russia. Did Trump have, now if you remember, the top news, I'll try and make it short, because some people, the media understands that if things are too complicated, they might report on something, but they, it, you got to have sound bites. So he will be the sound bite for my liberal friends to see. Much of the argument from the liberal side of the aisle is there was some connection with Trump and Russia. Okay, most of you are familiar. Did he collude with Russia? As the investigation moves forward, there's been a story that's been a true story. There's even been books written on it that showed that there was also collusion when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, passing a particular deal for the Russians to, to get about 20% of our uranium. And uranium, obviously, you make nuclear bombs out of it. But it was a Canadian company that we also had a contract with, the United States, for uranium, but we permitted it to go. This seems like there were reasons that they permitted certain things, because then Russians gave a lot of money into the uh, Clinton Foundation, and these were all things actually it just came out that the FBI realized, they looked at, they said, wait a minute, all of the Russian collusion, and that's just one, this is called the uh, uh, fusion. I think it's a fusion. There's a few different names in here. Uh, but maybe the fusion one, no. The fusion one is this. The other thing, to make it simple, when Trump was running for president against Hillary Clinton, FBI Director James Comey had a, a, a sit-down meeting in secret with Donald Trump. And what he showed Trump, and it's called, some of the news sites refer to it as different, but it was called the Russian dossier, meaning they had like a file. They said, Mr. Trump, we have to show you something that is very uh, concerning to us, to the U.S. government, to the FBI, to myself, Mr. James Comey. And what did they show Trump? They said, we have a file on you, and it is a Russian file that they have secret information about you that they might use as to blackmail you. Now, they actually had this, okay? It's called the Russian dossier. And they showed it to Trump, and it had various things in it. And it was purported by our own media and government to have some possible factuality in it, and, uh, papers, media reported on it. Now, watch this. And they said it's showing that the Russians possibly had evidence, maybe video, that you yourself were in Russia, in Moscow, at a hotel, and you hired prostitutes. And these prostitutes peed on a bed in front of you. And that bed you were in with these prostitutes was the same bed President Obama slept on when he was visiting Moscow over his times in, as president. I guess it's an official Swede or whatever. Now, Mr. Comey presents this to Trump. Now, understand how insulting this is, Where, and the origination of who, get, who made this. So they were presented to Trump. Trump came out when it finally got leaked. I think New York Times, one of them leaked it. And he said, it's a lie. It's a lie, and it's a scam. Now, he was really mad, because now we know it was a lie. But this little information came from a British spy that was hired by a firm. I think that's the Fusion GPS, okay? If I get the name wrong. 
But this firm was basically a firm that uh, does sort of like political attacks. They had a history of accusing people of being pedophiles. And they did that. They're kind of a real down and dirty firm. Well, our government had the information that it was indeed this particular firm, hired by somebody and funded by somebody, that had that fake thing, which also included a British spy who said, yes, we got this. Now, we knew these last eight months investigating Trump on Russia. We knew that there's a possibility that some of Trump's people had contacts with Russians. So the FBI, Mr. Mueller, all the investigation. And then we also realized that whoever funded this fake smear thing, which is fake, like holding a National Enquirer or whatever, but made it into the hands of the FBI director and presented to Trump before the campaign, before the election, or maybe right after he got elected. But they kind of showed it to him in a way that said, I'm thinking like Trump would think, I'm going to bail out now. You see? I didn't realize it was going to get this bad. But maybe in some way, because James Comey, when they had information that this thing was fake, and it has to do with Russian collusion, but from the Hillary campaign, because last night the breaking news was it was the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton who funded this. So Hillary's campaign, but they knew, they were asking, Congress and others were asking, we want to know who funded this. They knew, our intelligence agencies, FBI, because there were certain people that they had a gag order on. They were saying, now wait a minute. They did this politics, even with the FBI, even with how this was going. Now the biggest agenda you'll see out of this is the mainstream media will still portray all of this as a personal attack, though it has everything that really we've been investigating for months collusion with Russians, there indeed was some collusion with this people that they were hired, and it came out that Hillary herself, her campaign, and the Democratic National Committee funded this firm to do like this blackmail thing, and then it made it into the hands of an FBI director, who most of them who are investigating Trump right now, over the whole thing, were all like Democratic Hillary people. You say, but does that play a role in law and all. Sure. Because that's enough to say this whole thing is a joke. Yesterday when I went to, to uh, I made that little video yesterday when I went out to uh, Cal Allen. Right after I made that little video called Update man there was traffic and there was about I'm not per uh, probably 13 top cars so I knew something happened. And then I, I said, man, but there's so many. I thought it was like a raid or something. It was on the road going out to Mathis where I did my little Bible study with my daughter. Then later I saw the news and a lady died in a wreck. Her vehicle, I saw it last night as well, I think, but her vehicle stalled out right there on that road. That's why all those cop cars were there. She was pushing her vehicle along the side of the road and some kid in his vehicle hit her, and she died. Now, they gave a citation to the kid. As far as I could see, there's no alcohol or anything involved. The citation was not speeding. It said just failure to control his speed. Okay, and they said there might be more charges. And remember when I covered the famous uh, Judge Benyalis, you know, running into multiple people. They said, well, there's a... Uh, he was, as far as I know, it said he wasn't speeding, but she was right there on the road. Tragically, she lost her life. But still, regardless of whether this young man was speeding, regardless of DUI, and she was in the road, not 150 feet off the road, up of the embankment, okay? 
And they said he's sided with that. Just failure to control. And I told you in the past, I said, you don't need to... The, that case of when I covered Vinales, I said they made every excuse in the world to, to cover up for people that are connected. I don't know what else will happen to this young kid that hit that lady. And it's tragic she died. And they also said, well, we don't know how he didn't see her. Uh, sometimes when you're on the road, which I drove that road yesterday, you know, you, uh, it's, you don't always have to be either texting or whatever, which is possible, but analysis was in that. But sometimes uh, you see people, you're looking at the road. And sometimes you don't. You, you, you have maybe a tunnel vision. But either way, that was something I spoke about before. I guess I'm going to upload it because it's. I talked about some news issues. And I'm don't, the reason I mentioned Hillary then, the main, but finally uh, ABC mentioned a little bit last night about the Fusion GPS. I think that was the name of the firm that the Democrats had to have fake Russian documents in collusion. Look, and there's other things besides that particular thing, but the other uranium deal, the whole book was written on that, meaning Hillary Clinton uh, had to give the approval as Secretary of State for this 20% of our uranium, which we were contracted to go into Russia, and there were connections, and even with the Podesta people. But the mainstream news, though you could, th this could be a scandal just as huge. And, and all of a sudden, they're beginning to say they're just going after Hillary. And I know a lot of my liberal friends who strongly believe in liberal beliefs. The Hillary Clinton campaign, they did some illegal things to Bernie Sanders during their actual campaign. There were also ballots. They found them missing. But yet later, Bernie jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, if you want truth and justice, I don't agree with the way Trump does these tweets and all. Okay? I understand what Jeff Flake said yesterday. But you can cloak things in an honest, righteous way and be presidential or, you know, a, a senatorial and all, and still make decisions about war and death and stuff like that that are just as devastating. It's just they're cloaked in people saying, you know, we still do bad things, but at least we act presidential when we do those. And I think actions are more important than whether a person's presenting themselves exactly correctly. But that you will have very little media coverage, though that's a big thing. And many of my liberal friends, when they hear me speak on this right now, they, they've already bought into it that, oh, this is just going after Hillary Clinton. No, it's not, because... There was a New York Times reporter also that began speaking out on one of these issues. They went after her, New York Times, the gray lady I walked past. So this will be like a little update. Start it right now. Okay? I think I'll, put, I'll link that little thing from Chris Hedges. I don't agree with everything he says, but it's beneficial to see that it's not just a problem, because in that article he said it's not just... We've got to do more training and more other things. It's the way we have come to the place where we are at as a country. Okay? All right, this is number one for today.